Welcome to today's OR Today webinar. We have a great presentation for you today featuring Kevin Anderson. OR Today would like to thank our sponsor, HealthSmart Industries. Since 1969, HealthSmart Industries Company Incorporated has developed and marketed innovative solutions to aid healthcare facilities in their delivery of surgical instruments and other life-saving medical devices to patients. HealthSmart Industries' mission is to, is to continue to innovate, continue to support, and continue to serve the healthcare industry and support services that make it possible to deliver quality healthcare. Visit hmarks.com for more information. We would like to offer a free subscription to OR Today Magazine to each attendee today. For nearly 20 years, OR Today has provided perioperative and SPD professionals with up-to-date news and information about their profession. Our monthly magazine aims to educate readers about new guidelines, techniques, and equipment, as well as practical information for career building, problem solving, and overall well-being. To get your free subscription to our magazine, please visit ortoday.com slash subscribe. Today's webinar is eligible for one continuing hour by the State of California Board of Registered Nursing. You can obtain your certificate by completing today's post-webinar survey. The survey will be emailed one hour after the completion of today's webinar. You must complete the survey to receive your one CE hour, and you will be able to download the certificate directly from your computer once the survey is submitted. If you have any questions, you can reach us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. As I mentioned earlier, Kevin Anderson is our presenter today. Kevin worked for 18 years in the acute care setting, serving in various clinical and leadership capacities, including clinical coordinator of general surgery, operating room manager, and manager of sterile processing and endoscopy services. His sterile processing team was recognized with IHHCSMM Confidence Builder Award for their outstanding quality improvement in 2018. Kevin is a published author with articles featured in Outpatient Surgery and the AORN Executive Newsletter. Kevin, you may begin whenever you are ready. Thank you, Jennifer. And hello, everyone, and thank you for attending this presentation called Getting the Most Out of Your Reusable Medical Devices. Another uh, disclosure here, I am an employee of Healthmark Industries, which is a manufacturer and distributor of medical products. No compensation has been received for this presentation. And of course, all opinions are those of myself. This presentation is not intended to be used instead of a training guide or anything like the instructions for use. We always encourage that you review instructions for use and also industry guidelines and standards. And another little disclosure to add, I'm also working from home. I have a wife, three kids and a dog, so I apologize in advance should there be any unexpected noises that happen in the background. I've tried to prepare everyone in advance, but you know stuff happens, so I apologize in advance for any of that. Just a little quick uh, blurb here about Healthmark. Um, Jennifer did give a great introduction to us, but as a manufacturer in health healthcare products, we also have a policy and philosophy. We not only want to provide the highest quality evidence-based products, we also strive to support our customers with education because we believe an educated customer is our best customer. And this presentation is a part of that commitment to educating our customers. So every presentation we have objectives, right? So we want to understand the various costs associated with reusable medical devices. And we're going to review some best practices in care and handling of reusable medical devices, which include stainless steel, minimally invasive instruments, endoscopes, etc. And then we want to understand uh, our role or your role in the life cycle of these reusable medical devices in your facility. So getting into objective one, we want to understand 
the various costs associated with these devices. So our initial purchase is the obvious cost, right? It's just that price tag up front when we purchase it outright, or maybe we have a capital equipment purchase that's associated with it. That comes with it a depreciation cost. And so that actually hits our budgets over time. Same with a leasing situation. And that will recur, that payment will recur for the life of that contract. So just a little bit of things to be aware of in terms of those basic costs. Well, then there's associated costs. Many of our equipment or surgical devices also come with consumable products that must be purchased continuously in order to use the device. An example would be like a bone mill. A bone mill is like an instrument that we use for spine procedures that also required a disposable component with it every time it was used. Or an arthroscopic shaver is another one because it requires that separate consumable component to go with it. Perhaps we need a new Sonic, which is capital equipment, because we purchased a new surgical robot. We will have costs for that capital equipment, but we could also have installation costs for plumbing and any other construction type work that is necessary. And then there's preventive maintenance. This is a huge expense. Many times the health system will have system-wide preventive maintenance contracts. They may have different contracts for stainless steel, power equipment, rigid and flexible endoscopes, and all kinds of various things. But even though they're always working on getting better deals on these PM contracts, they are very costly nonetheless. And while the PM contracts are expensive, it is better to have them and extend the life of your surgical assets rather than to just repurchase every time something goes wrong, right? So it's a, it's, it's a necessary cost. <clears throat> then there is the cost of processing. Here's a look at uh, processing endoscopes. Corey Ofsted, she did a great project that was published in the Communique, which is now known as the process. Uh, so this is a little bit a little bit older, but recent enough to uh, make sense to us. But Corey and her team looked at all the different factors and costs that are assumed when processing endoscopes, from PPE to bedside cleaning, all the way through inspection, HLD, storage, documentation, all of that stuff was taken into account. And now we know that some costs are variable based on different factors, which is why she ended up with a range for processing costs. She estimated that a flexible endoscope could cost anywhere between $114 and $280 to process. It wasn't unusual for my old facility to do between 40 and 60 scopes a day. So if we do a little math and we did like 60 endoscopy procedures, our cost to just process them may have been somewhere near $16,000, almost $17,000 in that one day. So there's a lot to be uh, cognizant of when it comes to these costs of processing. And then just some upfront, again, surgical uh, asset costs, uh, reusable, reusable devices and instruments, whatever you prefer to call them, they can cost anywhere from as low as $5 uh, for an AdSyn all the way up to $75,000 for maybe an advanced uh, endoscope, like a duodenoscope. Before I left my former facility, we were in the process of spending close to $1 million on flexible endoscopes because we didn't have enough inventory for the volume that we were doing and then those value added procedures that like inspection and drying and all those things that are getting added to the process to make it safer so we were doing all of those and investing that much money so that we could try and do it right every single time then there are unexpected costs or the ones that you try to avoid. This is the reality. Devices can lead to SSIs when they're not processed correctly. Or maybe we don't have the inventory we need, just like I discussed before, for the volume of cases that we schedule. So we run into delays and postponed cases. And our quality could possibly suffer, right? Because we're trying to rush and maybe cut corners. There might be dissatisfaction of surgeons, patients, management staff. All of that can happen as fallout from this. But what's the bottom line? It is expensive. Healthcare is expensive. A lot of that expense comes from our devices and the processing of them. 
So that brings us to objective two. We will talk about some of the best practices in care and handling of reusable devices, i.e. those stainless steel, laparoscopic, da Vinci endoscopes, all that stuff. <clears throat> stainless steel, this is probably the most common, right? And it's it's been around forever, what seems like forever now. Uh, and it's because it can stand up to our sterilization methods and it can be good and functional for a very long time and they're just very practical instruments. Uh, one thing that you might want to watch out for though, this could happen is getting those floor grade instruments. A lot of times, you know, uh, supply chain may, uh, or some, anybody, any well-meaning person could end up uh, purchasing an instrument that is cheaper because they want to save money. But a lot of times that turns out to be a floor grade instrument and it really shouldn't be reprocessed and used in uh, ORs and things like that. That's more uh, for single use uh, little procedures here and there. Then we have our MIS, minimal invasive surgical instruments. This could be laparoscopic, <clears throat> excuse me, or robotic. So these are very, very much increasingly common nowadays as we continue to convert from traditional open methods to more minimal invasive methods and in using these type of instruments. And then we have our rigid and flexible endoscopes, right? We have many, many, many different types of these from ENT, nasal and sinuscopes to arthroscopes, laparoscopes. Then we have the flexible ones that for cysto, GI, bronch uh, bronchoscopes, even anesthesia is using these. They're being used all over the place. And not just in the OR, we see these on the floors, ICUs, by pulmonologists, intensivists, all this stuff. It's getting used all the time in all different areas. So what are we seeing as causes for damage? <clears throat> Hopefully the problems in the picture jump out at you, but putting a $7,000 arthroscope into a basket of instruments like that is not the proper way to transport such an expensive and delicate item. We can't control the surgeon and whether or not he accidentally runs the shaver over with the tip of that scope. Um, but we can control how we care for and handle the scope, right? Instruments can be used improperly. Sometimes we've seen a scope be leveraged really hard by the surgeon inside of uh, the body cavity and that it ends up bending the entire scope because they're only, you know, five millimeters in diameter. They're pretty fragile but they could also have prolonged exposure to saline or blood or even water. Uh, why would water be a problem? Some, if it's overexposure, I mean, there's water that has chloride in it um, and that's the main culprit when it comes to this overexposure to saline, blood or water. And that overexposure can lead to pitting and other uh, degradation of your instruments. So. And then we have the use of improper cleaning chemistries <clears throat> or engraving of instruments that can cause damage as well. So how are we going to properly care for our reusable medical devices? I think it is wise to let principles guide us for training and competency. We wanna learn how to process and use devices based on their IFUs and also those industry standards and guidelines. We want to use inspection and protection throughout the process. And we need to put the care back in care and handling. I know that we get cavalier with these expensive items because we get used to them and we get used to the stresses and the rigors of our days. But if we had to put our own money in to buy them, I think we would be a little more apt to care for them correctly and to take care of them at every point throughout the process. And as costly as it can be, preventive maintenance, like we said, will be absolutely necessary to get the most out of your reusable medical devices. And lastly, there may be other things that we do to get the most out of our devices, like invest in newer technologies or get creative with the existing technology that we have. This is, uh, this is not an end-all, be-all. This is not all-encompassing. There's a lot that goes into your reusable medical devices and getting the most out of them. So these are all great starting points that we're going over, but this is not the end. You always have to be uh, looking for ways to improve and get the most out of them. So training, 
this is critical to our effective use and handling of our devices. I remember when I was first started in healthcare and to take my BLS certification test every year as part of our institution's policy. This of course is a good policy. However, our training for BLS because we were recertifying, this wasn't our first certification, it only consisted of some discussion in a group going over these points, whatever, in our department. And then we would all sit together and go over the test and answers. So we would all share answers and input and all this stuff. Real nice, right? But how effective do you think that was? It wasn't very stressful for us, but it wasn't also very effective either. Now, BLS is life-saving training that you don't use too frequently, unless, of course, you're a first responder. So you would like to think that it would be a little more important to do that training effectively, right? Thankfully, this has changed over time. We now do training and education with a return demonstration and a test, and nobody gets to help you, right? This is a much better way to train and obtain competency because competency is another level, and that is where we want to be. If we are not there, then we probably shouldn't be doing what we're doing, especially when it comes to processing medical devices. And by that, I mean, you sh not that you shouldn't be doing the job, but you should stop and, and get the training and get the competency that you need to keep going. Here's an example, just to illustrate, right? I wanted to make cookies, but it was something that I had never done before. My wife's really great with all things cooking and baking me. Not so much, I don't really have that experience. So I thought, how hard could it be? I just went into the recipe and I went to town. Well, the picture is the unfortunate result of my first try at baking cookies. I knew right away that I messed up, that doesn't look right. But I had no idea what I did wrong. I was certain that I followed the IFU, or the recipe in this case, to a T, right? But my wife looked at it and she's like, you put too much of something in there and she tasted it, brave soul. Yeah, too much butter probably. And we went over the recipe together and sure thing, she was right, I did put too much butter. For some reason, I made an error in my reading of that part of the recipe and I basically doubled it. Which, if I do say so, I, I thought it was still kinda, it was still good, but it wasn't what I was used to and obviously it didn't look so hot either. Of course, I wouldn't rest until I got it right, but this was a result of my inexperience. I had no real training, I had no practice, and it showed. But I also feel much more competent now reading the recipe and baking a good cookie. And this is what we need, true competency. And this, of course, is the picture of my redo, right? And so I feel much better now being uh, in my abilities to, to bake a good cookie. Another example, a little more close to home for all of us in the device processing is laparoscopic instruments. They've come a long way from early design, similar to the picture maybe on the left. So this is a, the design that you see on the right. Now, I know just from looking at this handle on the right that this is a modular or a take apart model of instrument. These are great for getting the instruments clean, but they can be a lot of fiddle factor when it comes to assembling them or taking them apart more than what you would think. Then you have the nuances of the different manufacturers because they don't create them all the same, right? So if you add different manufacturers of these things, it gets even harder. Well, we got a bunch of these things at my form of facility and they are great, but it wasn't long before I would get calls to the OR saying that the graspers weren't working or they weren't put together. How could that be? I huddled with my team. I showed them how to do this. I encouraged them to get hands-on, gave them the time to try it out, all of that good stuff. And then I found out that one of my midnight people did not get that chance to get hands-on with it. And that was the one that built the trays with the problem graspers. Well, that technician should have probably said something about not getting the training and not feeling comfortable doing that. But this was really on me and I knew it. This was me doing a poor job managing and educating. So I came in on midnight shift and I literally showed her how to do it. And I had her demonstrate it repeatedly that she could do it backward, frontward, over and over and over again. And when I thought she had it, I asked her to do it more, right? We both felt better going forward. 
she knew she could put them together and take them apart as needed for cleaning or prep pack and so did I. Our quality just got a little bit better because I knew I wouldn't be getting many if any calls from the OR about those graspers, right? So that is the competency level we should be working toward with all of our devices. But then we have point of use care. This is another foundational piece to reusable medical devices. Many quality control issues, especially ones regarding dirty instruments, could be alleviated if our point of use care was on point. So what does point of use care look like? It looks like removing soils intraoperatively and at the end of surgery before sending to SPD. They don't soak the instruments in saline. They unclamp them or disassemble the modular ones. They actually handle them with care, right? No heavy instruments on top of delicate. Forceps and pointed instruments shouldn't be sticking through mesh baskets. And we want to protect those endoscopes and other delicate high price items. And of course, we want to refrain from the unintended use of instruments, right? Like using a ronger for cutting a pin. And then we want to do the proper transportation, which we're going to get into that a little bit more. But all of these things and anything else required by IFUs or standards. I say that because IFUs and standards change, right? So we always need to be up to date with our information as well. Now, the picture on the left is a hip acetabular reamer found in decontam. It clearly was not properly cared for at the point of use. It should not be so grossly soiled, and we all know that. But then on the picture on the right, it's the same type of instrument within a tray. It almost looks like it belongs on the clean prep pack side of SPD. However, I assure you, this was a set that was sent down and is waiting in decontam for processing. This is a great example of what instruments should look like when returned from the point of use. Now, you can't really see it in the picture, but these instruments were also sprayed with a pre-treatment product. I mean, this is fantastic work by the team in that OR, and they should be proud. And another important step at the point of use is to make sure that soils don't start to dry and form biofilms on the instruments. There are three things that you can do within standards and guidelines to alleviate this problem. You can spray your instruments with a pretreatment product. You can place a wet towel over them, again, water, not saline. Or you can use a product like the one in the lower right picture that is designed to maintain humidity and prevent the drying of those soils. Now, each method is acceptable. And remember, many of us are processing instruments for various locations, whether they're off-site clinics or other departments throughout the hospital, there may be a need for any of these different solutions in those various areas, right? So utilize any of these uh, methodologies, put them into practice, get them in your uh, standard operating procedures, those kinds of things. Now, transportation. Transporting our medical devices is so important, and many times items are transported by the end users that may be familiar and comfortable with the correct way to transport items, but, you know, with the growth of centralizing the processing, using couriers, and many other ways that we're moving these devices around facilities, we need to make sure our process is built to protect these assets, no matter who's transporting them. In the picture on the left, you see a rather common method for transporting flexible endoscopes. This bag may not have necessarily come from an endoscope uh, you know, manufacturer or anything, but there are many products very similar to that bag that are designed to transport endoscopes. However, I like this picture because it sort of illustrates what's happening inside those cinch sacks that you're using because we often prefer those cinch sacks because they're cheap and easy to use, right? However, they can all often be identified as a culprit when it comes to endoscope damage. So transporting endoscopes is much, much safer with containers similar to the ones you see in the middle there and with a lid and the proper biohazard labeling, all that, very important. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, this is the kinds of external and internal damage that can happen to your endoscopes when they're not properly handled. 
Sometimes you will see pinching and buckling externally, which is in a way is great because it's easy to see and send off to repair all of that. The problem is you can get internal damage as well. And this can be present with or without signs of external damage. The picture in the middle there shows the buckling of the biopsy channel. This could be bad for the endoscopist trying to run instruments down there, but it could also be bad for the cleaning process and lead to more extensive damage as well. And worse still is that you won't see that internal damage unless you have the proper tools, which we're gonna get into a little bit more later. Now, hopefully it is obvious how wrong this picture is on the left. You have extensive or expensive, uh, rather, cameras, rigid endoscopes, and light cords all just tossed in a heap there. Cameras and scopes like that, we said earlier, they can run between five and $7,000 each. Light cords aren't cheap either. And when these items don't function properly, can lead to delays and dissatisfaction that we discussed, right? Why can't we return them in a manner like you see on the right? And the answer is we can. We just have to be intentional about it and set ourselves up for success in this area. We will also look into this type of situation a little bit more as we go on. Now, this item that you can see on the left picture here is more expensive than it looks. Very simple uh, device, but it's expensive. And it is an important accessory to a device that providers use to intubate critically ill patients all over the hospital or even in regular surgical cases. And as you can see here, these were not coming from the OR, okay? The one on the left was from the ER, which doesn't say. And the one in the, the right there, if you can see that sticky note, is from the ICU. That one was tubed to us. Can you believe that? Clearly a need for better processes was needed housewide and a need for better training was also evident. Incidentally, these are also departments that often complain that they didn't get their stylets back when we lost them. So eventually we did get a better process in place that worked, you know, with an in-person check-in of these items with documentation and all that good stuff, right? So another problem that may be common out there. Another component is water quality. This is important for your devices because poor water quality can harm them, which we had alluded to earlier, whether it's a pH problem or a hard water problem, or just not having the critical water source you need to get your final rinsing. The test strip you see in the middle there is just a simple way to check your water for hardness, alkalinity, pH, those basic uh, quality markers, right? This simple test could help you identify how hard your water is, and maybe indicate that you are in need of a softener system like the one you see on the left, or perhaps you don't have the critical water source that you need like a deionized water or a reverse osmosis. That picture on the right is a DI system. These critical water sources are important because they help to remove all the impurities from your instruments. That water is so pure, it latches on to all of the extra nasty stuff that wants to sit on your instruments and it pulls them off. So when I first started managing an SPD, we did have a DI water system. The problem was it hadn't been maintained in probably over a decade since it was installed. Now, that was probably, unfortunately, that's probably uh, something that happens very, very regularly across the industry. So if you're familiar with these water sources, they require continuous maintenance and changing, <clears throat> excuse me, changing of tanks. So that all needs to be done on a continuous basis. You can see in that picture, they got the green lights. That's, that's a good sign. So having all the things you need, moving on to the cleaning part, poor manual cleaning is important as well. Whether it is proper brushes, chemistries, equipment like stringers and IFUs, I wish I had a picture to share, but there's this great product used for closing surgical wounds I won't say the name, but there are a number of skin glues out there now, right? Well, it's a rather common practice to use adds and forceps to hold the wound together and then paint the wound with skin glue. And consequently, the forceps end up with this glue all over them that's extremely hard to get off. So 
I had one time found some of these adsins with glue soaking in decon in some mysterious concoction that I didn't really recognize as our detergent. And one of the te techs uh, discovered some solution that would loosen the glue. Unfortunately, the solution was also corrosive and it would also destroy the instrument, especially in those occasions where they would forget and it would sit there for a long time. So let's stick with the, the detergents and the things that we're supposed to use on the instruments, right? So prep and pack. We need certain things on the prep and pack side to properly process, whether it's for inspection, function testing, tray liners, tip protectors, all this stuff. And that's what we're getting into next. So inspection this is a critical step to processing medical devices. And we don't all have the best vision either, right? So add to that fact that we're required by some IFUs to use enhanced visual inspection tools. Our devices are just too complex and too numerous to, to not use inspection tools in order to properly care for them. And furthermore, the lack of adequate inspection could possibly lead to harmful consequences down the road to our patients. So hopefully you don't uh, already, if you don't already believe, you will understand as we go from here how important these tools are. Now these are just some examples of inspection tools <clears throat> that are available. The one on the left and going from left to right, the one on the left is just a simple digital magnifier and it, it pops up a, a, an image on your screen, on your computer screen. And so you can magnify up to I think like 200 or 300 <clears throat> times with that. And so it really blows up what the unaided eye has a hard time seeing. And then moving to the right, you have a, a borescope, which we need to look down the lumens of our devices. And then on the right, you have a couple <clears throat> just basic uh, magnifying uh, devices that are relatively uh, you know, on the cheaper side and, and readily available. So this is just an example of a clamp where it might be evident to the unaided eye that there is something wrong there. It may or may not be, depending on how good your inspection is. But if you were to use a tool, <clears throat> a magnifying tool, you will see something like you do on the picture on the right there where it's an, a, basically a crater in the instrument. That's a pitting problem, and that pitting problem could lead to all kinds of problems with the cleaning process and potentially pose a risk to the patient um, and also to the device itself, you know, compromising it and making it more prone to breaking as well. So lots of issues there that you may or may not see with the unaided eye. <clears throat> so more inspection tools. This is an electrical leak tester or insulation tester, whatever you want to refer to it as. I consider this to be an inspection tool because it makes a sometimes invisible electrical leak, many times invisible electrical leak, it makes it visible to the one inspecting. And on the next slide, you'll see why this is so important. It's a must have, number one, because it's required by IFUs, <clears throat> but also because there's a significant risk to our patient should they get burned by a stray electrical current, leaving a compromised area of the instrument. So if you look at the picture on the right, the main white area that is highlighted is this, like the surgeon's view. He's looking at that area that he's trying to dissect or cauterize. If you look at that part a little bit further to the right that is circled in orange, you can see the stray electrical current leaving the instrument in that shadowed area. And that area may or may not be within the view of the surgeon. And if it isn't, they may not even know that they cause trauma to the patient's adjacent organs. So these electrical leak testers are another must have for your quality management system. This should be done on every insulated instrument every time. And a good idea would be to include maybe a checkbox for this step in your documentation. And to be sure, these types of incidences do occur and they lead to uh, basically unknown reasons for people returning to surgery and having post-op complications. 
This is something that it didn't take a whole lot to sell me on when I was a SPD manager. I hope that it is pretty obvious that these need to be taken care of and tested every single time. Moving on to function testing. This is a really important <clears throat> step. Take a simple Mayo or a Metzenbaum scissor. The surgeon may use these to dissect or cut delicate tissues. If these, you, uh, if these have little nicks or burrs in them, they could cause unintended trauma or bleeding and further complicate or compromise the procedure. So just doing a simple test on the front end can help us to identify those problems and get those scissors uh, maintained or sharpened or whatever that needs to be done. <clears throat> However, there are a lot of different types of instruments and they are all designed to perform a certain way. And with the wear and tear and the use and processing, and they're all subject to insidious damage that will hinder their performance over time, right? I wish we could go all over all of the different performance tests, but there are simply too many. And that being said, at its critical component to getting the most out of your reusable devices is doing these function tests, whether it's for rongeurs, osteotomes, biopsy punches, kerosens, all this stuff, curettes. I recommend this resource book on the right, this World of Surgical Instruments by Rick Schultz, okay? It says right there, it's the definitive inspection book, and it is to be sure. However, it also tells you how to function test many of the instruments that we use on a daily basis. So with increased volume of minimally invasive surgery, we often need a lot of cameras and endoscopes to get through a day's load of surgeries. One of the most frustrating and time-consuming delays in the OR is hooking up your laparoscopic equipment to find out that there is a problem with the endoscope. This is a simple device that allows you to check the scopes in the prep pack area to make sure the image is clear. And when I started in the OR, SPD had an entire outdated laparoscopic setup just so they could check the scopes, which that's great. It's actually not a bad idea, but it's not always feasible due to the equipment, compatibility issues, space, or many other circumstances. So this is a great way to get that checkpoint in, enhance the quality of your service, as well as identifying serviceable damage early when it is potentially cheaper to repair. One of those things, like I said earlier, it being frustrating in the OR, a lot of times, you guys, the ones of you who are from SPD that are here today, um, a lot of times you can't check this equipment until you're literally trying to start the surgery uh, as an end user and you start plugging everything in. You don't notice a problem until you're really literally trying to go. So that's why it can be so frustrating. And that's why I love this little device. This is a great little way to get that quality checkpoint in. Tray liners. I love this because it's a simple way to protect, <clears throat> excuse me, protect your instruments, right? We often see instrument sets that are packed, like you see in the middle, with delicate instruments poking through the side of the tray. They're getting damaged. They might even be causing holes in your blue wraps. Who knows? But tray liners are just such a simple, nice solution to protect your instruments from that problem. And they also service a sort of secondary benefit for the end user because now you don't have stainless steel on stainless steel. You actually have a white backdrop to sort of easily see all the instruments that get laid in there. So real nice touch to, to doing your instrument trays is those tray liners. And there are also a myriad of different tip protectors and organizers that will help to prevent damage to your instruments. You just have a couple there in the pictures, but there are many, many, many. I do really, really like that one on the left. It's sort of an organizer and a protector. Uh, gosh, just imagine opening as a, a scrub nurse in the operating room, opening up my tray and seeing that in there. It's already organized. I don't have to reorganize everything like we all do you just kind of open it up and lay it out and everything's there that's like wow that's amazing and that might be a little wow factor idea for your um, facility so maybe try that out too 
specialty trays. All right, so with simple organizers or using an actual specialty tray, this is like way underutilized solution. We typically see trays that look like the ones on the left. They just have a bunch of instruments in a pile and we try to organize them or even protect them with the mats, but they still look kind of a mess or there's variation because the techs all put them in there sort of differently and all that, right? But often our vendor trays, like the one you see in the middle there, they come with great uh, organization, right? You can see at a glance, everything is there. It's easier for the tech to prep this tray and easier for the end user to find what they need. To do this with our facility owned trays would take a great deal of time and effort, but I assure you that it would be well worth it in the end. I mean, just look at that. I literally can see at a glance whether or not everything's there. You know the sterilant is gonna reach all the instruments. It's just, it's beautifully organized, right? Why don't we do that with our trays? Here are just some examples of trays that um, people have taken some time to organize them. They have protective mats. Uh, they have a way to hold the instruments in place, like the, the laparoscopic one there on the bottom middle. Then you have what looks like maybe an arthroscopic set of baskets on the right there. They're all in their individual holders. The end user can see the tips real easy. And that's how you know which instrument you need when you're in surgery is uh, by looking at those tips, right? And then you have the one in the, in the middle top there that's sort of a smaller specialty tray, but it has delicate items in there. And that's a great little tray, a great little uh, solution uh, to prolonging the life of those instruments. Now here are a couple more. You have the rigid scope on the left. Too often, we invest in our scopes and cameras and other expensive devices, and then we fail to invest in a great containment solution. So I urge you, when you see quotes for these purchases, don't be tempted to trim the fat and lower the cost by excluding the purchase of trays. And on the flip side, when you ask for quotes, be sure to ask for the proper containment devices, because having these correct containment systems, it, it's, it, it may seem like an unnecessary expense sometimes, but it will actually save you money in the long run in the repairs and all those um, unexpected costs that come up, right? I love the picture on the right. That's one I was really proud of. We had bought these brand new flexible endoscopes and um, got these great organizers and got them in there. We even took a picture of it put it in our instrument tracking system so that when people were processing it they could see exactly how it's supposed to look right that is you know it took a lot of time it took some effort you know arguably we didn't have the time but but i'm glad that we did it because now we're actually going to save time and save money in the long run with that particular setup now tray optimization all right this is another challenging and labor intensive process. This is not an easy one, but again, this can have a phenomenal impact on efficiency, money savings, satisfaction when it's done right. This is different than just specialty trays or tray organization. We tend to have instrument sets that are that you know that were purchased like 20 years ago and they're rarely changed. And if anything, we may add to them different instruments based on the preferences of newer surgeons that may come aboard, right? However, we rarely look at the trays and say, gosh, it's really time to reduce the number of instruments here. We're only using like 20% of this tray. Or maybe we have a tray that was for a specific doctor and he, God rest his soul, passed away five years ago. Why are we still storing and managing this tray that he was only he was the only one that used it, right? We could put those instruments to use somewhere else and save money purchasing or replacing old, old instruments, right? So one example is we had a lap coli tray, right? Lap coli's were one of the first laparoscopic procedures to come into common practice. And they had this great lap coli tray designed for, uh, you know, the, the, the 
mini open procedure to put the troll car in and then all the different um, instruments. There was probably like 46 instruments in there, including laparoscopic and open instruments. And then we would bring in a whole nother open major tray with it for every single lap coli. Well, real easy, most of our tray, most of our cases never went to open. So we just stopped sending the big basic or major tray, whatever you call it in your facility. We stopped sending that altogether. And then we had instruments in there that were more of a preference item for certain surgeons. So we started taking preference items out that were low utilization, right? This is These are the docs who maybe didn't do all the volume. And we started taking those out and we reduced it by, you know, a good maybe 10%. So it was, you know, not a ton, but it was a, a, a lot in the grand scheme of things and all of the processing that we have to do. And then secondly, we were low on these trays because the volume of uh, need for laparoscopic procedures continued to grow. And we were doing lap hernias and things like that. The lap hernias needed way less instrumentation. For whatever reason, uh, the techniques they used, they didn't need all of those instruments that were needed for a lap coli. So we developed a second tray for those lap hernias that only required, you know, maybe mm, a third, maybe a quarter of the instruments used in a lap coli tray. So we were actually able to uh, create a tray for that procedure and then alleviate the need for our lab coli tray. Hopefully I explained that really well. Hopefully you guys are doing those things in your facility on an ongoing basis because it's really important that we do that as surgery just continues to evolve, right? And we continue to get new docs in and things like that. So preventive maintenance, this is critically important. We talked about to all of our devices, whether it's stainless steel or minimally invasive or endoscopes. So just look at what little, uh, you know, a little maintenance can do for your instruments. You can see they almost become like new, right? You have the needle driver on the left with the before and after. You have a simple uh, malleable or S retractor there maybe on the right, and you can see it. I mean, they both look almost brand new after a little preventive maintenance. Then you have endoscopes, whether it be flexible or rigid. Uh, you see that one on the left, right? It has those little, it's a little gray area. Hopefully you can see it. Maybe I can use this uh, laser pointer feature, but this gray area is easy to see with the unaided eye. And that is definitely a sign that you got some wear and tear on that endoscope and it should really go in for servicing. And then this endoscope has some wear and tear along the rims here. And that's not like what a brand new scope looks like. And if it doesn't look uh, pretty darn close to brand new, it's a good rule of thumb to get it serviced, okay? Now, at my former facility, I was a new manager at the time and our process was not very proactive when it came to preventive maintenance. We waited until someone complained about an instrument not working and then we'd send it in for repair. I actually didn't even know that we had a contract for preventive maintenance. I came from the OR. I didn't know all this stuff. I was learning on the fly, right? You see, my department was so overwhelmed with like day-to-day -day quality issues and other things that they couldn't afford to send trays out for maintenance. They like needed them to service the, the cases. And so they just waited until they broke. This is like really risky business and a huge dissatisfier, obviously. So we finally started taking advantage of our preventive maintenance it wasn't long before subpar unrepairable instruments were identified and replaced, but these were all in the ready for patient use inventory. That what you see in that picture, that was just after a very short amount of time. That bin that those are in filled up really quickly. Don't let this happen in your facility. Steam quality. This is also important to getting the most out of your devices. We're used to getting calls from the OR about bio burden in, our, in, in my old facility. And then when we'd go to investigate, we'd find these little black specks that didn't really look like blood or bone contaminants or anything like that. I even would run protein tests on them. They would turn negative. So I was pretty certain that it wasn't blood product. We decided to do a steam quality test. And so what you see on the left is all that sediment 
that was being forced into our trays through our steam. We discovered that there was no filtration system in place for our steam. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. So we had them installed and then the black sediment problem went away. Now that's a steam filter and it requires routine maintenance. So we need to make sure that those PMs are getting done routinely or that same problem will rear its ugly head again. All right, instrument tracking. This is a great technology boost that I would highly recommend if you want to get the most out of your reusable devices. As the name implies, these systems can help track your devices and where they're at in the process. They're also good for data collection, documentation, many other things, organization, all that stuff. The picture on the left is the scanner for a tracking system that was used to document where endoscopes were, where they were going in the facility. It was a very organized process and it utilized best practices for a centralized endoscope processing unit. And at my facility, we used our tracking system to help with our preventive maintenance schedule. You see, we could schedule preventive maintenance based on usage rather than time, which is way more cost effective. It extends that useful life of your devices. And there are many systems out there now, including barcode laser etching, RFID instrument tracking, which is amazing. But the important thing is that you implement the technology. You don't have to necessarily have the latest and greatest. However, there is definitely caution when proceeding, all right? While these systems are great, they require a lot of maintenance and data input to make it work appropriately. So if and when you do this, make sure you are committed to making the most of it. It may require the hiring of someone that just manages the data within the system. It may require a lot of organization for your storage areas, but I promise it is worth the effort in the end when it's done right. Now, we're gonna move on to objective three. We're getting close to wrapping up. We want to understand your role or our role in the life cycle of reusable medical devices, okay? Surge techs, scrub nurses, they're going to be responsible for that point of use care. Sometimes the circulator does a lot of the loading of instruments into a case cart. So they can be a part of that too, or maybe they give breaks for the scrubs, or maybe the FA is being entrusted to take care of the instruments, okay? They need to be accountable to do it correctly. SPD techs have to do their part. Take the time, stop rushing through all the critical inspection steps. Sometimes we just wanna rush and make that mountain of backed up instruments go away, but that's not the way to do it, right? If you rush and you have quality problems, now you have a lot of rework to do when you don't really have the time to afford for rework. Now in management, they need to advocate for their team and the things they need to stay up to standard and to reprocess these devices correctly and safely. Your biomed team often is servicing devices in-house or your processing equipment in-house. They need to be involved, but not in the typical silo. They need to communicate what they're doing and provide repair and maintenance reports. It wasn't uncommon when we'd call in a problem with a device, one of our cleaning equipment or whatever, they might come in look at something and leave and never tell you what they found, what they were doing, you got to communicate and you got to operate as a part of a team, not just, oh, you're just coming to do your job, right? This impacts an entire department and then it impacts uh, procedure cases and patients all over the facility. And then infection control, they need to learn about these critical processes that take place in SPD. They need to help with internal audits and advocating for the resources that are needed for this critical infection prevention department that isn't necessarily traditionally thought of as infection control and infection prevention, right? But it is. And then quality. They need to be involved. Reusable medical devices, they pose a huge risk to the institution. 
I mean, just look at ECRI's top 10 list for risks to patients and medical device processing is almost always up there every year. Same with Joint Commission. They publish these types of lists as well. They're always on there. We've got to get better. I also believe there is a massively underutilized tool for standardizing education and training in our facilities. Many of you are probably familiar with a program called HealthStream. Well, that is just one program. I'm sure there are many others that are similar out there. But we normally do our mandatory education for, you know, fire safety and other environmental safety modules every year through that platform. And it's kind of exhausting because the modules build up. There's like 20 of them or whatever. But we used <clears throat> in all the facilities I've worked in, we've had this type of health stream program, right? This platform could be perfect for pushing out basic education on care and handling of reusable medical devices and point of use care. I mean, think about it. We have people all over the system now transporting these devices. They need proper training. They're not all familiar with the processes that are more familiar to scrub techs and or nurses and SPD techs. We are missing a huge opportunity to educate our people. This has also been a hot topic on Joint Commission's radar for the last several years. So again, I have yet to see anyone do this, but there's great opportunity to better educate and standardize across your health system with this platform. And no, I do not have stock in HealthStream. I just think it's a great opportunity that we are all underutilizing. And then another thing we want to do is report our problems. We want to track and trend them. We want to obsess about them, not in an unhealthy way, mind you, but in a way that makes you relentlessly pursue perfection in your department. Have a quality board post your goals, post your progress, talk about it in your huddles. That's assuming you're having huddles. Hey, you better be having huddles, okay? Talk about this stuff. Put it in your goals, uh, you know, your uh, the ones, your performance review goals, right? These are the kinds of goals that actually have meaning, have impact, have value, all right? Let's put those in our performance goals and, and get on them. And then don't forget that advocacy part. You have a bunch of educational materials there that you see in the middle of the screen, books, standards, and study materials. These are needed to, uh, to be available in every department. They really should. It's kind of a random picture on the left, I admit. It's a heater dryer for heat sensitive devices. I wish I had the picture of the cameras that were melted because a well-meaning tech put them in an autoclave to dry them for processing in the low temp sterilizer that does not tolerate moisture, right? tens of thousands of dollars worth of devices were destroyed in that one day. They didn't autoclave them. They just sat them in there because it was warm and they were trying to get them dry because they were needed for cases later that day. We didn't have a dryer that was designed for that specific purpose and we paid a very hefty price. We also should have had more cameras so there wasn't that pressure to turn them around in the first place. But that's why you see that picture there on the left. So in summary, we talked about all kinds of costs associated with reusable medical devices, not just the price tag in the beginning, but all those different costs that are incurred as part of ownership. And we talked about some best practices with an emphasis on some, this is not everything. There is so much involved when it comes to getting the most out of your instruments and reusable medical devices. I've been in many facilities and I assure you, none of us are perfect, but that shouldn't stop us from trying to get there. Don't get yourself overwhelmed, just get started somewhere and never stop improving. I just stole the Home, uh, home Depot slogan, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. We also talked about some of the ways you can help get the most from your devices, no matter what your role is in the facility. No matter what your role is, I just want to thank you uh, for doing what you do on a daily basis to take care of the expensive assets that take care of our patients. It is not easy. It is not often a glamorous or a recognized for the tremendous value that you bring to the table, but it is so critically important. Thank you for attending this program. I hope that you were able to get something out of it, and hopefully that's more than just a CE, but if nothing else, at least you got that. 
<laughs> and of course, if you have any questions, um, again, my name is Kevin Anderson. You see my email up there uh, on the screen. I don't know, Jennifer, if we have time to answer any uh, audience questions at this time, but uh, again, you're also welcome to send me them via email. And uh, just a big thank you to Jennifer and all of you who attended today. I wish you all the best and thanks. Thank you so much, Kevin, for a fantastic presentation. Um, we are out of time today for questions and uh, an answer session, but if you do have any questions, please feel free to uh, email Kevin here uh, at the email address that he has provided, um, or you can email any questions to us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. I'd like to encourage everyone to visit today's sponsor to learn more about the products they provide to our industry. Visit hmark.com. A quick reminder that you can obtain your certificate by completing today's post-webinar survey. The survey will be emailed one hour after the completion of today's webinar. You must complete the survey to receive your one CE hour and you will be able to download the certificate directly from your computer once the survey is submitted. If you have any questions, you can reach us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. We will be back in two weeks with another webinar. Visit ortoday.com webinars for more details and complimentary registration.